Obviously, uh, we're, we're very fascinated uh, by Atchison. We think it has a fascinating history. And Atchison is just a perfect example, in my opinion, uh, still undisturbed by uh, urban brawl uh, that, uh, that, that tell this history. Lewis and Clark, the Civil War, the wagon trains west, uh, the early railroad industry. There's just so much in this community that it's hard to, it's hard to pick any one part. I, I, I want them to, to come away with an idea of how that history contributed to what we have today. This land used to be under the ocean. You can still find fossils of prehistoric sea life all over Northeast Kansas. About a million years ago, during the Ice Age, glaciers pushed as far south as Kansas, pushing mounds of dirt ahead of them. 12,000 years ago, when primitive people and the woolly mammoth lived here, climate change melted the glaciers. And that created these hills. And that gave the Great River from the north one last bend towards the western frontier before pushing east towards the Mississippi. 5,000 years ago, the Hagea tribe wandered this area. Later, tribes split off. One group went north. They were called the Upriver people, or the Omaha, the people who stayed here became known as the Casa, the people of the South Wind. In the 1800s, this was as far west as pioneers could travel by steamboat before making footprints into the frontier. The California Trail, the Mormon Trail, the Oregon Trail, the largest wagon train in the history of the West left from here. That bend in the river made Atchison the western shore of the American waterway. Way too many incredible things have happened here for any ordinary place. The ticks and mosquitoes are numerous and large and have been troublesome all the way. For the want of provisions, I concluded to hunt. I have a bad cold. May 15th, the barge ran afoul three times today. Struck the sands so great the tow rope broke. June 4th, our mast broke. June 14th, dangerous waters, worst place I have seen. My cold continues very bad. Over three months of travel, more than 400 miles, they didn't bother to name a single landmark. The journals were full of trouble. July 4th, this morning, Joe Fields was bit by a snake. Ow. Sorry, Captain, I think I was bit. Poison bite? Not sure. Swelled much. Doctored with bark. Joe Fields went and got himself bit by a snake. Poison? Looks like you got yourself a day off, Private. Let's get you to the boat. Out of the blue, something changed. The journals were suddenly almost joyful. 
We camped on one of the most beautiful plains I ever saw. A very handsome creek meandering through. Nature appears to have exerted herself to beautify the scenery, which amuses the mind, conjecturing the cause of so magnificent a scenery in a country thus situated far removed from the civilized world. Today, in honor of America, we fired around from our bow piece, and the men each enjoyed an extra dram of rum. And for the first time, they named something. They called one creek Independence, and even named a second creek. As this creek has no name, and this being the 4th of July, the day of independence of the U.S., call it 4th of July 1804 Creek. The first frontier celebration of American independence happened that day, when Lewis and Clark were here. Atchison was long a border ruffian nest. The great roads westward passed within a few miles of Atchison. I have seen several wagons camp just outside the corporate limits, pioneer settlers and gold seekers, with faces set for Pike's Peak. Today I went out on the high prairie, and the furthest thing I could see was the white canvas of a moving train. I have longed for the West, and here it is at last. Horace Greeley, Atchison, Kansas Territory, May 15th, 1859. Go West, young man. Congress left the choice of whether Kansas would enter the Union as a free or slave state to the settlers of Kansas. To win the vote, both Southerners and Eastern abolitionists flocked to the territory. Whichever side held the mayor's office in Atchison controlled an open door to Kansas settlement. It seems certain we will have to give the abolitionists at least one good thrashing before political matters are settled in this territory. In two attempts to elect a mayor, more than 2,000 votes were cast in a town with only 500 legal voters. I wish you wouldn't go. The Missouri Bushwhackers and the Kansas Jayhawkers keep stuff in the ballot box. We'll settle this today. Before the Civil War started, violence over the slavery issue had already killed more than 200 people in Kansas. The courts mandated the mayoral issue be settled in the prescribed way of Western law. Dr. John Strangfellow was the Southern choice for mayor. Samuel Pomeroy, the pick of the abolitionist. Doctor, call it in the air. Tail. As it is. By the flip of a coin, Samuel Pomeroy became mayor. After years of literally killing each other, that day in Atchison, suddenly the two sides called a truce. Two years later, Kansas voted to enter the Union as a free state thanks in part to a truce and the flip of a coin in Atchison. People knew the Pony Express wouldn't last. Railroads and the telegraph were coming soon. You could already get mail to California by stagecoach in less than a month. But speculators bet on the long-term payoff if they had a government contract for West Coast mail service. The contract was awarded to a bid for express service, a relay of horses and riders, preferably orphans at least 14 years old, 
galloping across the frontier from Missouri to California in only 10 days. The Pony Express started with great fanfare out of St. Joe to advertise the Missouri connection. But after about a year, the starting point of the Pony Express made a quiet switch to the company headquarters in Atchison. I'll never say Kansas is flat again. It's 10 o'clock. That's because Cyrus Holiday of the Atchison and Topeka Railroad said so. He helped invent modern time, you know. You're telling me someone from here created time? It used to be time was based on the sun. Wherever you were, when the sun was straight south, that was noon. So time was a few minutes different in every town. When the railroads came along, there were trains to catch at a scheduled time. But whose time was a problem? So for the first time, time needed to be the same in every town. So Cyrus Holiday, along with the other railroad owners, agreed to create standard time zones across the United States and Canada. Nah, the government would have to do that. Congress didn't accept standard time zones until 35 years later. C-Y-R-U-S, Holiday. By the time Cyrus Holiday retired in 1900, in Kansas there are more miles of railroad per capita than any other state in the Union or country in the world. See, he was a pretty big deal. Hey, see if you can find a picture of the first train in Disneyland. Whose name is on the engine? C.K. Holiday. Cyrus K. Holiday of the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Someone from here created time? Geez, next year tell me that Mickey Mouse came from here. Pioneer boom followed by the railroad boom helped make Atchison a very wealthy western town. Millionaires built homes that give Atchison one of the greatest concentrations of Victorian mansions in the country. Many of the brick streets were paved by William Bellar. Atchison folks called him Deepy. At five, Deepy lost his hearing to illness. Deepy, get off the track! At 10, he lost his legs to the train. Deefy became a brick mason and was really good at it. One day, Deefy set one brick every 1.6 seconds for eight hours, non-stop. You can read Deefy's story in Ripley's Believe It or Not. And Guinness still registers 46,000 bricks in one day as the world record set by William Ballar in Atchison, Kansas. A visiting missionary passed through giving interviews and lectures trying to raise support for poor sick children. Hey, I just want to say hi. Oh, well thank you so much for coming. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, what's your name? Oh, I'm Wilbur Chapman from White Cloud, Kansas. Oh, nice to meet you Wilbur. Um, uh -huh. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I go to school. My parents uh, own a farm and we raise pigs and do corn. I really wish there was something I could help. The missionary had an idea. Do you think if I give you two dollars that you can buy a pig and raise it and uh, when it comes really really big sell it and give us some of the money? Yeah, yeah, I think so. 
So they made their plan, and the reporter got a cute little story about a kid helping other kids. Well, thank you so much, Wover. Yep. Appreciate it. <laughs> the story spread and was put in newspapers nationwide. The story became so popular, even city kids wanted to raise a pig. Wilbur decided to walk Pete around town on a leash to raise even more donations. The idea worked. Each week, kids around the country would follow the progress of Wilbur and Pete in the newspapers. City kids wanted to raise a pig. Eventually, Pete went to market and the money went to help kids. Wilbur and Pete are honored with a plaque in White Cloud. E.B. White said he named the hero in his book Wilbur in honor of Wilbur Chapman. And it was the story of Wilbur and Pete that started the worldwide popularity of the piggy bank. The fair was fun. I like the food. Yeah. I like the rides. I really like the roller coaster. Yeah. Hey, let's build one. What? A roller coaster. I wish I could fly. Girls do not hammer. What are you doing? We're building a roller coaster. You're going to kill yourself. Maggie, have you ever held a nail while someone takes a whack at it? I most certainly have not. Girls do not hold nails and they do not hammer. Doesn't your mother teach you anything? You're going to kill yourself. Hello, Maggie. How are you today? I'm very fine, thank you. The girls are out playing in the carriage house. Yes, I know. The girls are in the loft. They're, they're what? They're planning on riding the wagons out of the barn and pretending it's a roller coaster. Grandmother Otis believed girls should be sugar and spice. Her granddaughter had a worm farm. You get down from there this instant! And when she grew up, she set the women's aviation world record for highest flight. And the record for the fastest transcontinental flight. And was the first woman to fly across the ocean solo. She was not the only little girl to have a wish come true. I wish I could fly. Gugilo Marconi invented the radio. It required battery power. You tuned in a station by moving a needle around on a quartz crystal, and you had to use headphones to hear. The next 30 years, advancement was slow. Radios were expensive. There were five radio stations in America. 
We'd appreciate it if anyone hearing this broadcast would communicate with us, as we are very anxious to know how far the broadcast is reaching. And how then in 1921, Fred Stein invented the first successful radio to use plug-in power. He added a dial tuner, an amplifier, and a speaker so the whole family could listen at one time. Within two years, 500 new radio stations signed on the air. Stein built a factory in his hometown where a thousand people built more than a million radios that they shipped all over the world. Fred Stein's radio invention started the modern broadcasting explosion. Charles A. Lindbergh. The depression forced Fred Stein to sell his radio business. The new owners changed the name and moved it out of town. But Fred invented more products and the Steins stayed in the town where the radio that launched modern broadcasting was first plugged in, Atchison, Kansas. They came from Parcelloni, Italy. In America, they built a simple fruit stand next to the road. Eventually, they expanded to a family grocery store. Today, it's the Pellucci family restaurant and lounge. Hi, can I get you guys something to drink? Um, iced tea, please. Yeah. Would you guys like to try an appetizer? Today? The family business has operated for five generations at the same location the Paluchis built that fruit stand. Oh, that sounds really good. Yeah, that's nice. All right, I'll have that right out for you guys. Thank you. The first Mexican family in town opened Atchison's first Mexican food restaurant. I'm Josephine Moctezuma Hillman. My father was Ed Moctezuma and my mother Josephine, who came to this country in the early 1900s and started what they called the Mexican Chili Parlor. My dad was a people person. He loved people, he loved to be around them. I think he was grateful to be in a country where he thought that you know, he could provide for his wife and his family. It's neat to, to be, Find someone on the street that comes up to you and says, oh, I remember your dad's place. We had so much fun there. Everybody loved my dad. My dad was the last direct descendant of the Aztec chief Moctezuma. Edward Moctezuma died of a heart attack. The restaurant closed and the Aztec empire ended in 1955 in Atchison. By the way, Fred Stein called his most popular radio model the Aztec. The Saturday Evening Post was known around the world and, and really is really a part of Americana. Covers of the Saturday Evening Post reflected the best of America. Only Norman Rockwell painted more covers than John Falter. He kind of told a story with his covers and uh, so then Rockwell picked up on that and then so he kind of started telling a story too and uh, Rockwell maintained that uh, a lot of what he did he learned from John Falter. John Falter did 128 covers for the Saturday Evening Post. Many of the places he painted are still around today. About 15 feet from us there's a, a mirror and they got a lady from down the street to come in, pose as a wife for for a person who was going to uh, uh, try on a suit, and it became a, uh, a post uh, a cover. He just had a wonderful talent of uh, blending landscapes and people together and, and uh, telling a story. And uh, this was a couple of kids out playing football, and this is up on uh, uh, 6th and Kearney Street. There's a person here in town that says, well, that was my uncle's car that he painted in out, out there. He did like to present the Atchison people on the covers. On almost two dozen post covers, the town that reflected the story of America for the world to enjoy was Atchison, Kansas. The 99s, the International Association of Women Pilots, wanted a tribute to honor friendship through flying. This was the home of Amelia Earhart, Atchison, Kansas. And with her birthplace here in Atchison, we were the centerpiece of the United States. So Atchison was chosen 
as home for the International Forest of Friendship. Featuring the state tree of every American state and national tree from almost three dozen foreign countries. And unique tributes to the history of flight and aerospace. And we have a moon tree. The moon tree, yes, Stuart Rusa went to the moon with the seed. Command pilot Stuart Rusa had a special cargo on Apollo 14, a small package that he carried with him on the moon, sycamore tree seeds. Of the trillions of trees on Earth, only six can claim roots that stretch to the moon. And this is one of them, the moon tree, that you will find at the International Forest of Friendship. Uh, we've got the original, I, believe, I do believe, seeing as how Mr. Rusa brought it here himself. <laughs> The annual Amelia Earhart birthday celebration is the third weekend in July, starting with the Friday night Lakefest concert, and Saturday, the Amelia Earhart Festival. Maybe it's just the bend in the river. Whatever. Way too many incredible things have happened here for any ordinary small town.